Welcome back. Amber Canver is at Elevate's annual CIX Technology Summit in Toronto. She's got an exclusive interview with venture capitalist Vinod Kosla, founder of Kosla Ventures. He was the first big VC name to invest in open AI. Amber, over to you. Thanks so much, Paul Bagnall. I am pleased to be joined by Vinod Kosla live at CIX. And Vinod, we hear one of your many accolades, of course, is that you were the first VC investor in open AI in 2018, which is wild because in 2018, we were entirely obsessed with something else. Talk to me about what you saw in open AI that made you uh, take a, you know, open up the, the wallet and, and make that initial investment. You know, my view of the world is not to follow what others are doing. I'm always focused on what is the next major breakthrough. So mostly when I sit in 2024, I'm thinking about 2028, what will be important then? It was pretty obvious to me, AI was following an exponential growth in both the amount of talent going into the field since about 2010, an exponential increase in talent, and the progress that talent was making. So it was clear to me we would have a chat GPT moment. Wasn't clear when, but it was clear that was going to happen. And I think that's so important to understand, especially people want clear roadmaps of the future. You invest in moonshots where there is no roadmap and ChatGPT itself was sort of a, yeah, I guess we'll roll it out, right? It wasn't like on this date, this is happening, right? But we were not investing in ChatGPT in 2018. Right. We were investing in the capabilities of AI that I thought would develop and how it would affect every aspect of life. It was in 20, 2000, I gave an interview to the New York Times, and I said AI, and this was an exact quote, will make us redefine what it means to be human. So I was already thinking 20 years before of the kind of scale of impact AI would have and how it would affect every job, every country, every part of the world. And so you have to then say, what's the right time? Obviously, 2000 would have been too early. 2018 turned out to be just perfect. But luck plays a huge role. I think I got lucky. Well, I, I wonder uh, about that because I, I know many people now see this as the future and take it you know, at your word that yes, this is going to change the world, but here we are more than a year later, Google still has 90% search market share. What does that tell you, that it didn't fall off a cliff? You know, what most brand new technology does is not go completely dis disrupt an incumbent, it creates new markets. And as you mentioned, ChatGPT wasn't like the huge intended market. AI will have uh, huge applications in lots of different areas, and it takes time to get integrated. So I would say to measure large-scale impact, one year or two years or even three years is too short-term uh, thinking. I look at 2028, 2030, and beyond to say what's going to be the real impact. Almost all large companies were built over decades, not over days or months or years. And you've said, and I find this, I, I don't know why my initial reaction is terrifying, but you've said in 20 to 25 years, 80% of all jobs can be done by AI. I mean, what do you think, that? And my initial reaction is fear. It is something that people are afraid of when they talk about technology replacing on that scale. Yeah, what I've said is 80% of 80% of all jobs, which is about two thirds of all jobs, will be done, okay. uh, capable of being done by an AI. Now we've gone through that transition before. In the United States, uh, in the year 1900, almost all the jobs, the majority of jobs were in agriculture. By 1970, that was 4% of jobs. So we've gone through this massive transition. I guess the point is it's jobs, right? When the, the future that you're talking about is like all jobs can be done mm -hmm. by technology. Yes, uh, <laughs> I think it will be possible. Yeah. It'll be great. What do we do then? 
you know, first, it's two-thirds of all jobs. Yeah. And we can do a lot more. Take a physician. Imagine, which I believe is going to happen, 80% of their job can be done by an AI. Uh, physicians interact with their patients once a year on average in, in the United States, probably less so here in Canada with the nationalized health system. In Australia, the typical physician interacts with their patient four to five times a year. So if AI is doing 80% of the job, each physician will have the time to have five times the number of visits or interactions with their patient. That's a really good thing because it avoids downstream disease and much closer monitoring and relationship between the doctor and the patient. Because it's so powerful, it begs the question, who should have control of it? Should this be something that's in the hand of a private entity, or should this be for the people? The debate of closed source versus open source. And I know that's a debate that's happening in the VC community. Mark Andreessen has said that you're trying to make open AI closed source. Um, are you? And I'm, why, I'm why is very, that the right very approach? Clear. This is a very powerful technology. So it will have global economic impact. I believe the country or countries, and I think of, uh, of progressive liberal values as one set of philosophy, and whether it's in Europe or Australia or India, it doesn't matter. I think of a set of philosophies uh, that, that traditionally we call Western values, uh, but I think it's broader than that. And then there's the Chinese authoritarian philosophy, which is if somebody gets in the way, we'll use Tiananmen Square type tactics. One of these will win the technology race, and because of the technology race, they'll win the economic race, mm -hmm. and because of the economic race, they'll win pol geopolitical influence. So I think this will be a battle uh, like a powerful weapon uh, You've compared it, would you open source the Manhattan yeah, Project? That's exactly right. Would we open source the Manhattan Project? I think for the very narrow set of technologies we call state-of-the-art AI, not all AI. I'm, you know, I started with open AI in, my, in the 80s with my first company, Sun, and we've stayed with and funded a lot of open source over the years. But in this particular case, for state-of-the-art AI models, and they're state-of-the-art only for a year, we should not give the Chinese access to what we have. Uh, I'm very yeah, confident that that would be the wrong move to let them get ahead of us. And regulation is a balance because of these very severe risks that you're talking about, but you don't want to stifle innovation. And, and that's a question that kind of brings me to Canada. Uh, we're often thought of as sort of the, the foundations of what created uh, open AI, that technology was born here, machine learning, large language models. How do you think about what it takes for Canada to win in the AI race? You know, why aren't we more dominant? Why is everybody talking about open AI when we've got an innovator here, Cohere, which, which does similar things? So my view is too much regulation too early when we don't understand where the technology is going will stifle innovation. Europe, for example, with all its regulation, has ensured that no AI company develops there. And maybe Mr. All well, but I think they've hindered themselves dramatically in a lot of tech areas because of overregulation. And early regulation stifles technologies. The regulation is needed, right time, right amount, and for the minimum amount that's needed to ensure public safety and other such factors. Uh, so I think it's important to realize when to regulate, how much to regulate. And Europe's a classic example of what not to do. <laughs> now, and, and then there's the point of, okay, so here we are in Canada, how do we take advantage of that? Do you look at Canadian AI startups, um, or any startups in general, um, and think about, well, do we have what it takes to win on a global stage? Well, clearly there's significant research capability 
here in the Toronto area and Waterloo. So there is huge AI talent. That's prerequisite, number one. So does Canada have that? Absolutely. Um, then comes the uh, question of when you start a new company. Because innovation comes from new companies, not from incumbent players. Uh, I've noticed in Canada, there isn't the level of boldness that you see in Silicon Valley. So even when there's a great technology, you can reduce the risk of that technology as a business and reduce the consequences of success. Uh, what I like to think of, and Silicon Valley is good at, is saying, I don't mind a higher probability of failure if the consequences of success are really consequential. And I think that's a philosophy that's missing in most parts of the world and is particularly unique to Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley entrepreneurs to be specific. And I think underpinning that as well, or as a consequence of that, you're not asking your companies to be profitable anytime soon, right? That became sort of a recent obsession after 2021. Speaking to a lot of venture capitalists uh, and startup founders, they were feeling pressure. Okay, now I have to be profitable. This is not the, par the, the market to, to be funding losses. Um, because you fund moonshots, do you need to be more patient with losses for a very long time? I think you have to be patient. So about the same time we funded OpenAI, which is 2018, Soon uh, around that time, we also funded Commonwealth Fusion, which is in Boston. It's a fusion reactor project, which most people thought was 50 years away. I happen to think it's 15, not 50. But we did fund a very long-term project. I think the key is not how do you fund loss, uh, how do you get profitable? I think that's the wrong approach. But it is important to survive financially. Mm -hmm. That means only spend as much as you can raise and maximize the vision for that goal. And sometimes you can have a smaller vision for the short term, yet keep intact a much larger vision, which I don't see too many people doing. They say, well, we have to do this in two years, that's the end goal. Mm -hmm. But it's not the end goal. 2034 is the end goal for any startup today. When you think about startups today that catch your interest, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for a great team, a great technical talent, and there's a lot of it here. Take somebody like Wabi, Raka, Raquel, Artisan, which we yeah. funded here, uh, great technical team. They took on something that's usually considered the domain of big players, like Google and Waymo, self-driving. But she came up with a drastically different approach based on simulation, how she could do the same thing that Waymo and others were doing at one-tenth to one-hundredth the cost. So clever, great technologists with clever business strategies is the combination, of course, going after very, very large markets. And Raquel's addressing a very, very large market. So you don't worry about the market side. You just want to win. And it's, that's what it takes. I only have about two minutes left, so I want to do a bit of a rapid fire, if I can, and just get mm -hmm. your thoughts on certain markets. Crypto. Is Bitcoin, and I know you've done other crypto investments, but is Bitcoin a moonshot? Is it the money of the future? Uh, no, I don't know. We've not been investing in crypto for the sake of crypto. We've been investing in crypto in real life uses. Like, can you build a 5G cellular network with crypto? That's a real life application that anybody can understand. Yes, that's what we do, not the speculation part of crypto. All right.